배찬 씨, 잘 들리나요? 예, 감사합니다. 한분 1분 정도만 기다렸다가 시작을 할게요. 오케이, so let's start today. 오케이, okay, so what we we gonna do today, and actually from today and the rest of this, I mean these the, the lectures of the course, we gonna cover uh, so-called functional aspects of programming languages or some mechanisms of programming languages that support so-called applicative computation. So by motivation. or background. So first half of the course, we the programming language we considered is the one which supports imperative computation, where all the computation is done by state updates. So we store something to variables, and then we read some values from the variable by continuously updating or reading those variables. So some computation proceed. And then at the end of the day, we get compute, maybe compute factorials or some other quantities that we care about. But there is another way of writing computation that is in terms of function application. So you can define functions and you can apply those functions. And in, by in doing so, you can actually achieve uh, what, whatever you can do in the imperative computation. And some, so in theoretically, imperative computation, and then the other kind of computation that we're going to look at, which is what I call applicative computation. That what I mean by this is by function definition and application. And then theoretically, one can show these two ways of describing computation have the same expressive power. So that correspond to so-called our Church-Turing uh, hypothesis or Church-Turing uh, thesis, which say I mean, the Turing machines can express all the notions of computability, I mean, the notion of computability. And so they have the same expressive power in terms of computability, but in practice, they are very different. I mean, there, there are programming languages that that is designed uh, based on this idea of applicative computation, mostly. That's a programming language like OCaml, ASCOP, and then the maybe in some extent Scala, Clojure, and so on. And then the there are some programming languages that is based on idea of imperative computation together with some additional things like object orientation and so on. So C is an example and C++, Java. If we ignore the object oriented aspect that's designed for mainly for the doing imperative computation originally. 
and the uh, Python is, uh, I think maybe I spelled it wrong. Python, in some sense, Julia is also similar. However, nowadays, it turns out what people realize is that actually for doing achieving some jobs, I mean, doing something using a programming language, it's extremely convenient to have a facility for imperative, I mean, writing imperative computation, as well as applicate, applicative computation together. So nowadays, I mean, if you look at programming languages like C++ and Java, Python, I'm not sure about Julia, I mean, because I don't know Julia that well, but C++, Java, Python, they support high order functions. In some cases in a bit limited form, some cases in full generality. I mean, although these high order functions are originally coming from this idea of applicative computation. That's because in the case of Java, I mean, these, having these kind of high order function is extremely useful when you do something with the so-called collection library. So it, it happens that before Java properly support high order functions, they mimic these high order functions, which appears in the functional languages using objects. So, and it was a bit clumsy, but now you can have a much easier way of using collection library in Java because of good support for high order functions. So what we're gonna do in today is we're gonna study something called the Lambda Calculus. Which can be understood as idealized, I mean, can be very small or core applicative or functional programming languages. So it's extremely simple, but it captures the core idea of what I mean, how to support applicative computation in a programming language. And it becomes the basis of all, almost all the programming languages that we can, I mean, all the applicative programming languages we can think about, like OCaml, Haskell, and so on. Another perspective of this lambda, I mean, this lambda calculus can be understood as a, some very small core programming language, but it also can be understood as a formal system, formal framework, where we can explore many design decisions about how to support this, uh, uh, this applicative computation in programming languages. So if you follow a certain design choice, you may end up with something like an OCaml. So that's something called eager evaluation language. And design choices of programming languages. So some choice leads to the eager evaluation language like OCaml. And that also describe how the functions are supported in Python. And the anonymous functions like Lambda is supported in Python and so on. Also, they're gonna lead to so-called lazy evalu evaluation languages, or sometimes called a uh, core by name. And more precisely, core by need. programming languages. And these languages are like Haskell. And actually, the pro some programming language like Scala, by default, it is based on this eager evaluation language, the idea of this eager evaluation, but Scala also supports some facility for the lazy evaluation. So the point I'm making is that this is a very small core language. And where by changing certain things in this language, we can explore uh, multiple design choices of the, the, the real world programming languages. So that's what we're gonna study. We will look at the syntax of Lambda calculus and then semantics of the Lambda calculus 
and analyze uh, various properties about, uh, I mean, some, we will look at also multiple choices of the syntax is then fixed, but we will change the operational semantics of this language that will lead to the different language details. Okay, so that's what we're gonna study, lambda calculus. So we will look at, we will study, we will look at the lambda calculus by first studying the syntax. And the syntax of lambda calculus is really simple. Uh, so something strange happens again. So I think there is some synchronization problem, which is a real world computer science problem. Anyhow, there is a syntax of a programming language, this uh, of lambda calculus. So, I mean, the syntax is very simple. We, in this lambda calculus, we only have so-called expressions. But there are three kinds of expressions in this language. The first kind is we have a variables. That a variable is one kind of expression. The second kind of expression is application, function application. So we have expression, first expression intuitively represent a function. And then second expression intuitively represent an argument or, of, of the function. And then we also have a way to declare a function using Lambda. So it's an anonymous function that we can declare. And so we can say, what is going to be the parameter of the function, and what's going to be the body of the function. So this language is an extremely simple language, which only have a three construct cases. One, the first case is a variables. Second case is a function application. The third case is a function, fun this is a function definition. And also sometimes this is called a lambda abstraction. I mean, if you have some experience with, I mean, the Scala or maybe in Python, I mean, in Python, you can write a Lambda to define an anonymous function that corresponds to the third case. And I think most of you already see function application in many, I mean, in most of the programming languages that you experienced with before. Okay, so let me just show you for examples. Ah, by the way, I mean, this is a language says, yeah, this is a language where the primary concept is the function definition and function application. So that's why we have uh, two cases. One is for function definition and the other is for function application. Okay, so just some example, some example is this, lambda x, x apply to so this means that we are applying the expression with the called lambda x dot x to another expression, which is lambda z dot z. And then the second example is like this. Lambda y, y x. C, CW. So we have uh, outermost case is a function application. So we are applying in this expression to this expression. And then, but if you look at the operator part of function application, it's a lambda, but inside the lambda, you can have another lambda. In other words, in this uh, lambda calculus, this uh, function definition by a lambda can be nested in an arbitrary way. So there is no syntactic restrictions about where lambda can come in, which kind of things we can apply for, for one to the other, okay? There's no restriction at all. And the third, 
something which the person who look at this first look might be a bit strange is that you can write programs like this or expression like this. So this is a similar kind of expression, but one thing that I, I'm sure some of you may not feel there anything strange, but some of you might have felt something strange. Something strange here is that we have a X, but X is applied to itself. That is also completely okay, because I mean, nothing in the syntax said we can't apply some variable to itself. And, but if you now think about this, this is a bit strange. That's because you have, I mean, intuitively you think X represents something. And then, so you are applying something to itself. It's like a self-application. And this self-application is a bit hard to understand if you think of this as a mathematical function. So that's why the domain theory and so on uh, is developed. But in lambda calculus, in terms of syntax, there is no problem at all. Okay, so how to do the programs in this language? Typically, when you do the program, we do program by encoding. So I'm gonna tell you about how what's gonna how evaluation really happens. I mean, so far I only defined the syntax. Just if I with the syntax, it, there's nothing in this language. But we have to give some form of dynamics. I mean, how we can evaluate these expressions. Ah, so, Jian, you're right. I mean, in Python, perhaps you can do the self-application as, as well. Yes, I think because Python is untyped, you can apply perhaps a function to itself. But the typed languages like uh, OCaml, if you want to, well, I mean, typed language like maybe Scala, that you, maybe you are more familiar with, if you want to do something similar, it's a bit more challenging. Okay, so for the, the doing the programming in this language is doing by encoding. And actually, when I think it, this Lambda calculus is developed by either Church or Cori, maybe, maybe Church. But then when that person developed this calculus, he used it to show or define the notion of computability. And that notion of computability involves some encoding. So because I mean, there is nothing like numbers here. We have to encode like a Boolean values numbers in this language. So a typical way of encoding the Boolean value is maybe encode things by functions. So here is a way to encode Boolean. I mean, this is an encoding of true in this language. This is an encoding of false in this language. So then you can define I mean, based on your intuitive understanding about what's really going on, you can define operators like AND or modular these, these encodings. Okay, so this, uh, and then other things for numbers, I mean, there's a very well-known encoding of numbers by so-called church numeral, which is, you say that the number zero is encoded by like this, so, Number one is encoded by the x, f applied to x. So it's encoding of zero, encoding of one, encoding of two is recorded by this. Of x. So really say that number zero is encoded by like applying f zero times. This number one is encoded by applying f once. Number two is encoded by applying f twice. I mean, this is informal notations. So you take function f, apply f zero times function f once, f, and twice, so on. So that's a, a, a way to encode numbers in the in this. I mean, this is more precisely on type of lambda calculus. And then via this encoding, you can express many kinds of computing, like additions, multiplications, and so on, can be expressed here. Okay, so this is a lambda calculus. And then the 
whenever we introduce a new character line or a new programming language, we first define the syntax, but then we have need something, some some way to manipulate the syntax, or to analyze the syntax. So the usual tools that we developed say, in the in the past, what we looked at in the past are the notions of operators like the operator that computes set of free variables from the expression. So this operator take, in this case, expressions and return a free variables. So that appears in the expression. And also we define substitution operator. That is an operator that takes variables to expressions in this case. And then we define something, the operator that applies this substitution thing, which is it takes expression and return expression where the substitution is applied. And in the case of lambda calculus, there's one very important concept that is called uh, alpha equivalence. or renaming equivalence. This is a mathematically, this is an equivalence relations on the set of expressions, which is really where, two, where we say two things are equivalent if we can obtain one expression from the other by renaming variable bound by lambda expressions. So, I'm gonna tell you what these are, but I think the best way to really do it is for you to think about this first, and then let me give you a more explanation about it. So here's an exercise. For three, I don't think you can do it because I perhaps have no idea what alpha equivalence means, but number one and two, you can actually define this. So here's an exercise I want you to do and define F of V, which is taking an expression and return a set of free variables and the substitution operator. And just like in any other programming languages that we studied, this language is defined in terms of the grammar, abstract grammar, which means that it's an initial algebra. And one thing we talk about, one reason we talk about initial algebra is because we can do syntax directed definition. So you can do the syntax directed definition of how, what this FV is and also what substitution operator is. Okay, I will give you three minutes to do so.
Okay, so here's an answer for this question. So if for free variable, we do the syntax directed definition, that means we do case analysis. And there are three cases, variable, application, and lambda abstraction. We do case analysis, and we can also use uh, recursions or inductions to define this the free variable operator. So free variable operator is defined by case analysis, is either expression and a variable or application or free variable lambda expression. And each case we define the what's gonna be the free variable in a given expression. The first case, the free variable is a singleton set X. Second case, the free variable is we collect free variable of E1, and then we collect free variable of E2. The third case, I mean our intuitive understanding of a lambda expression is that variable X inside the lambda is a bound variable. So what we do is that we compute free variable of E and get rid of this bound variable X from that free variable. So this is the definition of free variable that corresponds to your understanding about what free variable should be. And then the definition of the substitution is also very similar, but the key intuition behind the substitution operator is that we want to replace, I mean, you have a sub apply substitutions to some expression E, then intuition is that we want to replace the free variables appearing inside E, not a bound variable, but free variables by using the substitution operator delta. Okay. So we do that, define this syntax directed way. If we have a variable X, apply the substitution. It's gonna be the substitution applied to X. And then if we have application and apply the substitution, that's going to be just recursive application of substitution to each component, operator as well as operand. Now the tricky part is for this lambda, that's because we have to be sure any appearance of X, any variable appearing in E, uh, X appearing in E, then it's gonna it's not a free variable, it's a bound variable. So that's the first thing we have to worry about. Second thing we have to worry about is that this binding of X outside the lambda should not capture the X appearing after the substitution, okay? So, so we, that's the kind of issue that we thought about before. When we did define the substitution for the universally quantified first of the logic formula. So we ap approach this in the exactly the same way. We, we potentially rename X to X new. And then at, when you apply substitution to E, we change substitution. So that sub the substitution doesn't do anything for variable e bound variable X other than renaming it to X new. So whatever Delta originally say about variable X is overridden by this extra binding that we just wrote here. So then the question becomes how to choose X new. X new is chosen sufficiently. I mean, X new should be kind of, uh, should be a variable that doesn't really appear anywhere. That's the kind of intuition that we want to capture. So X new, should satisfy the following property. It should be sufficiently fresh, okay? But so it should not really appear in the outcome of applying the substitution. So delta of W. But then what kind of W we have to worry about? W we have to worry about is something that appears inside the body of the function E, except the specific, the bound variable that we care about. Okay. So, so this, I mean, this whole thing that's written here means that whenever delta is used, so we are only focusing on the usage of delta inside E, except for the variable X. And then 
you look at all the variables that appears in those usages, uh, in those uses, and uh, if we we have to pick some variable which doesn't really, which is not one of those variables appearing in those uses. And this is exactly the same things that we did talked about before. Okay, so that's the definition. And then now we define the alpha equivalence. So the alpha equivalence is defined like this. We say the expression E1 is sometimes we route it like this to, or sometimes we just write it E1 triple equal E2 to mean the E1 and E2 uh, alpha equivalent. If we can obtain E2 from E1 by applying renaming substitution. Okay. By renaming. The bound variables in E1, 0, or multiple times. So, what do you mean by bound variables? And bound variables are the variables that's bound by the lambda expression. So, if you have something like this, inside the expression E, then this X as well as X appearing inside the body of the lambda, they are the bound variables. And renaming means that we are replaced, applying the substitutions that rename X to something fresh, okay? So the renaming means that we are I mean, applying, if we are given lambda X dot E, we changed by some y e yes we, we are doing this to applying this type of operations where y it doesn't really appear as a free variable of x expression e and then this x arrow y is a substitution that we that change replace x by y and for all the other variables it doesn't do anything so it's really about changing one variable by another the other then one thing i want you to notice is in this definition we said we apply substitution zero or multiple times so when I mean, expression e1 is alpha equivalent with itself okay because it's a zero or multiple times and then I mean, it may have the bound names of bound variables in two alpha equivalent expressions. Maybe maybe multiple bound variables have a different names, different I mean, use the different variables. Okay. So here, I think the best way to understand this alpha equivalence is to look at examples. So here's one example. So lambda x dot x dot z, that is alpha equivalent to y. So here we renamed z to y, and we renamed x to, I mean, z to v, x to y. So, I mean, that's and by the those two renaming, they are alpha equivalent. Then a bit more confusing one is like this, lambda x, lambda y, x. That is alpha equivalent to lambda y, lambda x, lambda y. Now, if you think about this intuitively, 
they has to be equivalent. Really, the, there's a first bound variable, second bound variable, maybe like this. In second bound variable, divide like this. And then this, the x is with respect to the first bound variable. And that's the same. This is the first bound variable. And then this is the second bound variable. And y correspond to the first bound variable. So if you ignore the, the exact character of a bound variable, with the, 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 with the character name of bound variable, and just focus on first or second bound variable, they are talk about exactly the same thing. And you can actually show these two things are equivalent formally as follows. So we, we name, we say the one above is the same as lambda z and y dot z. So we, we rename x by y, I know x by z, and then we rename y by x. And then we rename z by y, then we get uh, this equality. Okay, so we have to apply alpha renaming. So this, this uh, renaming operations, renaming bound variable, single bound variable correspond to alpha renaming. So we apply alpha renaming once, twice, and three times to show that two things are alpha equivalent. And why we are talking about this alpha equivalent? It's because really when we define the syntax and semantics of the programming languages, we are playing with alpha equivalence classes. Okay? We don't care about what type of a name we use for, for, the, for, I mean, for the bound variables. It's, it, whether it's X or whether it's Y shouldn't really matter in terms of the execution of the semantics and the execution of the programming language and also the semantics of the programming language. Okay. So in other words, we are really, the, when we define the, the ex execution model, which will be done by so-called contraction relation and contraction reduction evaluation relations. And also when we define denotational semantics, things will be with respect to alpha equivalence classes. Okay, so, right. okay. so, so that's uh, some syntactic operator that we did. So are we, where we are? So we define the syntax of this lambda calculus, which is very simple, variable application and lambda abstraction. Also, we define three concepts. One is operator that collect all the free variables. And then we also define the substitution operator. And also we define alpha equivalence relations or for, the, for the expressions in, in this language. So in the process, we also talk about alpha renaming. Okay, so, so that's the basics of the syntax. Then what should we do? The next thing we should do is to define some form of execution. So the reason we define the programming language is to describe some process, something, some kind of changes that's happening. So in this case, we're gonna define something called a contraction relation, right, written like this, and also something called reduction relation. this. Intuitively, they are representing computation. With uh, expressions in lambda calculus. Okay. However, the John Reynolds later distinguish, I mean, this contraction relation and reduction relation, and then some particular evaluation relation. And then he say, evaluation relation is gonna be written like this, or the, this is for the normal order evaluation. The ego evaluation will be written like this. And he wanted, I mean, so this part you, I'm gonna talk about it again. So this 
contraction relation and reduction relation, I'll talk about some of the computations, which is not necessarily be the computation done by the actual machines. Okay. And then this evaluation relation is to represent some subset or some special kind of con way, special way of using contraction relation and reduction relation that closely correspond to what's really going on in the, in the real machine when the machines run programs. Okay. If you are familiar with so-called uh, software model checking and uh, some programming language stuff, the contraction relation and reduction relations can roughly be understood as so-called symbolic execution, which is not really the, the way of running the program. I mean, it's a way to run a program, but that's not the one that's run by the actual, I mean, when you run programs in written in the standard programming languages. So this is a special kind of a runtime. And on the other hand, this evaluation relation, it's a, symbolic execution is a much more general notion of e, uh, evaluation, which is very hard to implement efficiently. But evaluation relation is some specific kind of computation which can be implemented efficiently. So that's why most of the programming languages implement evaluation relation. So this is, this corresponds to actual runtime of programming languages. Okay, so what's the contraction relation? Contraction relation, as I said, it represents a very general notion of computation over expressions in the lambda calculus. And contraction relation arrow is a binary relation between expressions. And then this binary relation is defined by the inference rule. So defined like this. We say that uh, three inference rules. The first rule said, if we have application, but the first part of the application is a lambda expression like this. So then we're gonna, that can be contracted into like this. So this one said we have a operator, which is a lambda expression operand or argument to this function, which is E2. And then this the relation described uh, that, that actually the, the, this uh, running this function call. So we run the body e, E1, where the bound variable X is now bound to the, the argument E2. Okay. So this is a substitution which replaces X by E2 and all the rest, it doesn't do anything. But intuitively, this step represents, uh, I mean, doing the function application, I mean, the running the function application. And this is called a uh, beta reduction. Check the domain. Yeah, so this is called beta reduction step. And then the Left hand side is called a uh, beta red X. Or simply red X sometimes. And then second operation is called renaming. To say that if we, we can go from E1 to E2, and then E2 is alpha equivalent to E2 prime. So then we can go from E1 to E2 prime. So um, by the way, when I, I mean, instead of so notation of convention is because arrow is a binary relation, I have to write it something like this, technically speaking, but instead, of writing this way, so we will write E1, arrow E2, because that's more closely expressed. Uh, I mean, it becomes more evident that we are really describing computations there. So the first is called a 
This is beta reduction. The second called is renaming. So that was renaming really tells us is that this contraction relation is defined over alpha equivalence classes. Okay, so anytime during this contraction step, we can apply the alpha renaming. The third one is a context, contextual closure. So it's a bit defined in formal way. You can define it formally, but John defined it in formal way. So if E1 goes to E2, but then I mean, E1 prime goes to E2 prime, then we can go E1 to E2 where, where E2 is obtained. from E1 by replacing the E1 prime inside E1 by E2 prime. So this is, I mean, a bit wordy, but the intuitive picture about this contextual closure is that, think about, I have an E1, and inside the E1, the, there is a one occurrence of E1 prime, okay, somewhere inside the, this expression E1. So then we said, if E1 prime can go to E2 prime, so then this, uh, I mean, if you just carry around, what goes before E1 prime, what goes after E1 prime, just put it there. And then define it by E2. Then we can also say E1 goes to E2. Okay. So in other words, this contextual closure means we can enable us to apply something like a beta reduction and renaming to anywhere inside an expression. So here's an example of this operator. And this is a very powerful operation. It does it do something that's, that's not typically done by programming languages. So you can see this by some examples here. Uh, maybe the best way to do some example is actually doing some exercise. So the I mean, contract, the left-hand side expressions. As much as possible. Using arrow. Okay, so the first example is this. Step Y, lambda C, and C. Second, lambda x, 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 c, the third, y, c, c. And then you add one more. Lambda U, Lambda C, Okay, so in contract the left-hand side expressions using uh, this contraction relation as much as possible. So I'll give you three minutes to do so.
Yes, Robert. Ah, so contraction relation represent computation. So if you I mean this one, the first beta reduction step is really modeling function application. So if you keep doing this contraction, eventually you get an answer. So in the functional languages, the actual implementation may be a bit different, but conceptually what they are doing is that if you write lambda expressions in a functional languages and apply it somewhere, and these contraction, they follow essentially this contraction relation and produce an answer in doing so. So it may be a bit hard to see at this point, but if you see the, I mentioned about encoding of numbers and Booleans and so on. So then if you do this encoding, you can write very complicated Boolean expressions using lambda calculus. And if you do contraction, you get uh, an answer. Like if you have a true and false, it's equivalent to false. And you can get an answer like this because that's the something that we can do by keep applying this contraction relation. Did I answer what you asked or I answer something else? So Robert, I mean, if you get confused, you can ask me again, I'll try to give a different example. So in Lambda calculus, you can't, at the moment, you can't really, ah, so you I mean the, maybe some other examples for you is that, okay, so this is some examples. So that, I mean, it, that's true and false. So we define that what you wrote there as a true. So suppose we have an end operation. So we define end like this, okay? It takes two values, x and y. And then it takes some third one, z. And to get an answer, let me, I forgot how to write an end. Maybe, maybe not end, but let's do it with the church numeral plus. So we want to define plus for the encode, modular the encoding that I mentioned to you. So that, that's gonna take one number and one where n1 is not a single number, it's a complicated uh, expressions in the, in the lambda calculus, and then two. And then what it does is that it takes x and it apply n2 to x first and then n1. So that's, I'm saying that's a plus operation, okay? Why? Now, if we are define plus operation like this, then I might want to compute something like plus, uh, not three, one and two, okay. Plus, apply plus two, one and two. Now, if I expand everything that's written here, so, so I maybe just write the equality here. So, I mean, the, the plus one and two, they are all encoding of some uh, lambda calculus term. So we have n1, lambda n2, lambda x, n1, n2x. And then number one is set take function f. I 
think I was not quite right. So maybe, so yeah, I may have, so I have to, so yeah, I didn't have a answer here. And one, F. And it's the same. F2. So let's just write it F here. So lambda F one means you take a lambda X, F applied to X. And uh, two means that F from the X, F applied to F applied to X. Okay. So in that setup, one question we can ask, is it going to be the same? I mean, well, is it going to be contracted to three, which is this expression? Although I didn't really show you, I'm not going to show you. I mean, if you're applying this, this operator, then you can actually show that what's written on the top can be reduced to three. So that modular this encoding that expresses that, I mean, our encoding of a plus actually represents the plus operation. So that what you wrote is a lambda x dot lambda y dot x I mean, that doesn't represent any computation at all. But if you start to do something like this here, then it, it's, it does represent some comp the, the computation. Uh, so, so that's what I'm going to do. Thanks, Yun Juyan. I mean, um, what I'm going to tell you soon is about the minimal or final form. So let me answer this, this question first, and then, then I will talk about a bit about so-called church Rosa theorem and the beta normal forms and so on. That will answer the question that you raised. So the first case, if we do the contraction, the contraction, I mean, here's a, we can apply the beta reduction step, okay? So beta reduction say if you have a lambda, in this case, we have, lambda x dot y, and we have an argument, in this case, lambda z dot z, then we take the body, which is y, and apply the substitution. But y doesn't contain x, so this whole thing get, get contracted to y by a beta, beta reduction. The second case, if we do the similar things, then we end up with a new term. So we take a body, in this case body is y of x applied to x. So we apply, we uh, do that this beta reduction and beta reduction gives us lambda z dot z because of the first occurrence of x and then lambda z dot z again because of the second occurrence of x. And then we have a beta, beta red x again, apply the beta reduction in this case. Then we, because the body is just z, and then argument is lambda z dot z. So we end, we end up with the final outcome is lambda z dot z, okay? And then the third one, actually there are multiple ways of contracting this. And then for this the third case, we start with the contracting inside the lambda. And that's not what typically done in the standard programming languages. If you define procedure, then that what's written inside the procedure is not going to be run. I mean, procedure, the body of the procedure is going to be run only when the procedure is applied. But inside the lambda, in the lambda calculus, you can run inside the lambda, instead the body of the procedure, even before the procedure is, or function is applied. So we take beta red x, we use this uh, contextual closure, and we pick this, uh, sub-expression that appears inside this entire expression. 
And then we recognize this actually sub expression is a beta radix, some function applied to Z. So we apply this beta radix. So then that's going to be, right? So that's going to be uh, lambda x and z applied to z and z w. And then we, this is another beta radix. And if you apply substitution, then the beta reduction, you end up with z applied to z. And there's another way to obtain z applied to z, which is we first apply the, we look at this beta with x, that we have a lambda x and z applied to w. And if we apply the, the beta reduction in this case, we end up with something that's correspond to lambda y, yz applied to z. Now, if you apply the contraction again for the beta reduction, we end up with z applied to z. Note that these two answers are the same, right? Yeah, I mean, this may or may not happen, but it happens that in this case, this, this answer is the same. And then the third one is more interesting. So in the, in the fourth one, uh, there are uh, two beta redexes. One is this guy. And the other one is this beta redex. Let me erase this. Image a bit larger. So if we apply contraction on the this red beta with X, then here's an answer we're gonna get. Now, if you look at the body of the function, which it ignores, the body is just lambda y, no, lambda v dot v, which ignores parameter u. So if you apply the beta reduction, you get uh, lambda v dot v, and that's it. I mean, we can't really go anything further. But if you follow a different path and apply the beta reduction on the blue part, then we get something like this, lambda u, lambda v dot v, and now body is x, x, and then each x, the first x is gonna be replaced by its argument, which is lambda x, x dot x. Second is gonna be replaced by the exactly the same thing. So you can see that even though we apply the beta reduction here, we didn't, we end up with exactly the same expression, which means that if you keep doing this, I mean, we can, we will go on forever. Okay. So, so this shows sometimes if you choose the contraction in one way, you end up with uh, infinite computations. If you choose the contraction in a different way, you end up with a term, there's this computation which where you can't really go anything further. Okay, so now here I go back to the answer, the question that you raised. So, so we define something. So we say that some expression E is a beta normal form. Okay. So it's called beta normal form. So. If it cannot be contracted. What does this mean? It means that there does not exist, there does not exist a prime such that 
g goes to e prime. So in terms of a computation, we are done. So that's the end of the computation, okay? So this is a beta normal form that corresponds to the final answer that Juan is talking about. So then now the, the question becomes, suppose we are given an expression E and uh, so that before doing so, let me define one more. So typically this contraction represents only one step of the computation. Typically we are doing multiple computation steps. So we are defining reduction relation. So this is reflexive and transitive and actually alpha equivalent closure of error. So intuitively what it means is that if E and E prime are related by star, it means either E is alpha equivalent to E prime or there is a multiple contraction step that goes from E to E prime. So that's an intuitive definition, okay? So it, this arrow represents a multiple step of the computation. So then we can ask the following question. What is it? Given E, the question number, suppose we are given E, expression E, so then we can ask the multiple questions. The first question is, if E gets reduced, so this is called reduction, reduced to E1 and E1 is beta normal. And E get reduced to E2, and E2 is also beta normal. So then is uh, our E1 and Maybe R E one and E two will be our alpha equivalents. I mean, as I, I said, alpha equivalents it means essentially they are the same thing. So what does this verse tell us? It tells us if E one goes to E two. So E one, if you do the computations by this contraction and reduction, and all the way until you get an answer, E one the same thing for the E2. Are we going to get the same result? Well, maybe different. If it's different, that means lambda calculus is inherently a non-deterministic. So there will be multiple outcomes are possible. And if it's the same, that means alpha calculus and the, the lambda calculus is a deterministic programming language in some sense. And then the second question is, suppose I mean is Given E, e is it always possible to have a beta normal E1 such that E get reduced to E1? In other words, is it always possible to get a terminating computation from E1 that gives the final answer, that gives an answer that cannot be reduced to anything further? Okay. Is there always gonna be a terminating computation? That's the third question, and the second question. And then the, let me just show you the answer for these two. For the first, the answer is yes. Okay. The language is deterministic. For second, the answer is no. So it is the case that so it's a bit more subtle than just no. There are cases where if you can write an expression E 
which really doesn't really have a beta normal form. It can be contracted again and again and again. An example here is this one. And this one will continue to get contracted again and again and again. So what does it really tell us? Now, if you go back to our examples, the, our answer for the first, okay. Yeah, our answer for the first is related to why we, for the number three, we have a two different way of contracting the ex lambda expression that we are given. And these two different way gave us beta normal form, which is, uh, and that beta normal form were, were exactly the, I mean, are exactly the same okay, in this case. And this is not fluke. I mean, this is not by chance. It's, it's always guaranteed that this kind of things happens. So that's the, what this first is telling us. And now something that's not uh, kind of appearing, but appears in this example is what you can see in the number four. In number four, I mean, if given this expressions, if we choose the right uh, way of applying contraction, we may get a beta normal form like lambda beta three. But if you apply the bit this contraction in a bit different way, you may end up with the non-terminating computation, something that goes on forever. So then the question becomes how, which, what are the strategy that will give us the final answer, beta normal form, if getting beta normal form is possible. Okay. That's third question is. So what is a strategy of applying the contraction relation that gives us the beta normal form outputs of this E if such such an output exists. So I said, if you do it, apply the contraction a certain way, even if we had this expression E can be reduced to a beta normal form, you may miss it, okay? So then we can ask the question, is there any strategy that guarantees in some sense best in terms of getting the beta normal form? If there is a beta normal form, this strategy will always find it. And the answer is actually, it's also yes, yeah. And this is something called a normal order reduction, who are sometimes called uh, outermost and leftmost reduction strategy. Okay, so time's up for today. So what I'm gonna do next is I will talk about the some results that gives us uh, this number one to three so number one is related to something called church rogers theorem, one of the very famous theorems for lambda calculus. And, and for number three, I mean, there's, I'm gonna tell you what this normal order reduction is. Then we move on evaluation and denotation of semantics in the next week. Okay, so that's it for today. And thank you very much for attending the lecture.